the first thing I think I should say is I, I feel I shouldn't be here because um, coming from a country that does most things worse than you do, um, I, I feel that many of you might feel rather as I do when children's charities in Britain uh, invite Americans to come over and speak about child well-being. Um, you know, it's the only country that does consistently worse than Britain on most things. But actually, the way these problems pan out, how well countries do on all sorts of measures, does seem to be very strongly related to the extent of inequality. And I, I, I think, you know, when thinking about the politics of the future, what our, what our societies should be, where we want to go, it really is important to have an idea of the empirical evidence. We need not just uh, a, a vague hope, um, but a confidence that um, we can get there, uh, that society can work differently. And, and so I, I, I think that's, in a way, the role of the uh, empirical research. And I'm going to show you uh, quite a lot of slides. I hope you can all see the, the screen easily. I'm going to start off with this one. Can at least some of you see the red pointer now in the middle of the screen? <laughs> I, I'm going to point a lot of things out. Um, but anyway, along the bottom here, you've got national income per person, um, i.e. a sort of measure of where countries have got to in terms of economic growth, and up the side, life expectancy. And you can see that there's the rapid rise in uh, life expectancy in the early stages of economic growth and then it slows down and levels off. And actually, our societies have got to um, a really important point in, in human history. Uh, when we have we've got to the end of really of what rising living standards, rising material living standards can do for us. It's not only health which has ceased to be related in the rich countries, and I'm going to be talking entirely about these ones on the flat top right of the screen. Um, it's not just life expectancy that no longer responds to economic growth. I mean, it increases, but not related to economic growth at all. It's also happiness. Uh, if, if you draw happiness in relation to GNP per capita, you get almost exactly the same shape of, of curve. If you look at measures of well-being within countries, while incomes double or quadruple over a period, um, levels of well-being don't go up. So although in the poorer countries it's absolutely essential to have rises in, in living standards, we've got to the end of that. We are the first generation to have to think, how, how do we, what do we need to do now to improve the real quality of our lives? And I think most of what I have to say suggests that we need to be turning our focus from thinking about rising material standards to the quality of social relations in society. And I know that sounds a very sort of vague concept, but actually, how well a society functions in terms of involvement in community life, levels of trust, whether people, how much violence there is, all sorts of problems like that, is very closely related to inequality. Um, any, what I'm going to show you really proves the intuition that many, many of us have that inequality is divisive and socially corrosive. It proves that that's extraordinarily true, truer than I think um, any of us imagine. Um, I want just to emphasize, and of course everyone still wants more money, and so it's a bit odd to say that uh, economic growth doesn't do anything for us, and yet we all want more money. We all want more money because position in society matters very much. Um, it's more to do with social position and status competition um, that leads to that desire for more wealth. And look at this, these two graphs. Um, on the left, you have those rich countries that were up on the flat part of that curve in the last one on the top right-hand side of the screen. And you see there's absolutely no relation. It's exactly the same graph, just with the other countries cut off. National income per person along the bottom and life expectancy up the side no relationship whatsoever. Some of those countries, people can buy twice as much of everything as in the others. You probably can't see the countries, so I just read their names off. Uh, Portugal, Greece, 
Israel, Spain, uh, uh, New Zealand, Singapore, Germany, Italy, France, Austria, Belgium, uh, sorry, Australia, Austria, Netherlands, UK, Finland, Ireland, Denmark, USA, Norway, Sweden, Japan. So that's the group of countries I'm talking about. They're com they're, it's simply the richest countries for which we can get income distribution data, com compatible income distribution data. But although how, mu how rich they are on average, doesn't appear to make any difference at all, within every society there is a social gradient in health like this. These are, this is life expectancy against deprivation in small neighborhoods. And it, it really doesn't matter what country this data is for, there's always this extraordinarily regular social gradient right across society. Um, this is English data, so these are the most deprived areas with a life expectancy of 71 and a half. And they're the least deprived, the richest areas with a life, this is men and women combined, life expectancy of, of 79. You see, it's not a difference between the poor and the rest of society. The gradient goes right across. So it, even if you're not quite at the top, your health is likely to be a bit worse than if you were at the top. So everyone in this room is part of this gradient, even if there's nobody who would uh, count as poor here. I don't know whether there are or not. So income is very important within societies because it's about social position, it's relative income, um, but that doesn't mean that anything gets better at all if the whole society moves up. Um, you know, it would be nice to win the pools, the lottery, whatever, uh, because then we could have a sort of celebrity lifestyle and be like the people at the top. That's basically what that, our desire for more income is, is really about. Now I'm going to be talking about the effects of inequality. Um, the measure we've used is simply how much richer are the top 20% in each country than the bottom 20%. And this is how the countries pan out. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, <coughs> On the, the left are the most equal societies, where the top 20% are, are three or nearly four times as rich as the um, bottom 20%. Japan, Finland, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Belgium, Austria, Germany, Netherlands, Spain, France, Canada, Switzerland, Ireland, uh, Greece, Italy, Israel, New Zealand, Australia, UK, Portugal, US. These figures are, are probably a bit uh, uh, older than the most the most recent ones, um, and I think uh, Ireland became one, more unequal during that long boom. Um, so you might be doing a little bit less well than you are in these, this data. And this end, the most unequal end, um, Australia, UK, Portugal, and the US. Uh, there's sort of eightfold difference in incomes between the top and bottom 20%. So the more unequal countries are twice as unequal as the most equal. You know, if you're just looking at the rich developed market democracies. Now I'm going to be talking really about what happens when uh, the, the effects of those income differences. And actually they concern nearly all the problems that people worry about and in the news all the time. You know, the, the contrast people, I think, often have that our societies that may be materially very successful, though, of course, in the recession, we're worrying about that. Um, but even when, in boom times, people are worrying about drug problems and levels of violence and drinking and teenage births and, you know, mental illness and so on. And I, I think a lot of confusion about the causes of these social problems, a feeling that things are the social development of our societies is, is not so good. 